Agenda Profiles on Nantucket Community Television, Channel 18. I'm Charlie Walters. When I was a little boy growing up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I was an astronomy nut. And when I started to come down here in the summertime, one of the first things I noticed was there seemed to be a lot more stars in the sky than there were up in Cambridge. Of course, there weren't. It's just that you could see them. Well, in the time since I first came here, which is 60-odd years, more houses have been built on Nantucket than had been built up until that time. That's not a surprise to anybody who spent time here. But one of the ways that's affected Nantucket is we don't have the same dark skies that we used to have in the 50s and 60s and 70s and so on. And finally, that is being addressed by a group called Nantucket Lights. And the founder of that group, Gail Walker, is here with me today, and she's going to tell us all about it. Thank you for doing this. Well, thank you, Charlie. It's an honor to be invited on your program. Happy to be here. Uh, first of all, when did this start? When did Nantucket Lights start? Yes. It was founded in uh, 2021. We've just celebrated our two-year anniversary. And what was the impetus? What was the immediate impetus to put this group together? Well, the impetus to start Nantucket Lights um, was I had been working on light pollution issues in Sconset for quite a long time before that. And the Nantucket Civic League found out about it and asked me to help um, put together a public forum on light pollution. And I agreed to do that. And from that, I found out that there was actually broad support on the island for doing more to protect light pollution. I, I somehow thought it was just a, a, a problem in Sconset, but it turned out to oh, be no. a problem everywhere. <laughs> and so then I realized that um, there was no group exclusively dedicated to this issue. There were a lot of groups concerned about it, but they didn't have um, you know, the, the capacity to take on just this issue. So I had recently retired and said this would be my retirement project and um, hopefully a way to give back to Nantucket. Well, it's interesting that you got the idea from light pollution in Sconset because compared to other parts of the town or the island, like the town or like the airport, um, it's not that bad there. So for to have attracted your attention out there, that gives us an idea of how bad it is in town. Well, true, and I think also a lesson to be drawn from that is light pollution can be a problem everywhere um, because part of light pollution is just um, a street light or a neighbor's light shining into your bedroom window. That counts as light pollution. It's, a form, it's called light trespass, and that can happen anywhere. That can happen in a rural community. It can happen in a town. So it really can happen everywhere, and yes, Sconset is one of the darker parts of the island, um, but we still have some neighbors that, that have lights that are shining into their neighbor's yards, and their street lights became an issue out there too. So, um, yeah, so I started taking on uh, those problems and then just decided to apply what I had learned and try to help the whole island. Let's talk about the organization and how it's set up. This is a 501c4. Correct. And for those who don't know, what does that mean exactly? Well, um, we are a nonprofit organization and incorporated in Massachusetts. And you want 501c status with the IRS so that you don't have to pay taxes on donations that are made to you um, as income. A 501c4 is a, basically a policy advocacy group, which is what we are. A 501c3 is a charitable educational uh, organization. And we, we do that as well, but because of uh, wanting to get a new bylaw passed, we incorporate it as a 501c4. So even though um, donations to us are not tax deductible, we don't have, as an organization, don't have to pay taxes on any m donations that are made to us. So people can make donations, oh, it's just that they can't, they can't deduct it. That's right, that's okay. right. So uh, is there a executive director? How, do, how is that sort of thing set up? Well, it's set up, um, I, I basically serve as the executive director, that's not my title. Nantucket Lights, um, as an incorporation, we have three officers. I'm the president, I have a vice president, and a, a treasurer. And we wanted it very bare bones so that we could be nimble and, and make quick actions. But we have a steering committee that serves as an advisory board. And we've got people from all over the island serving on that. They come with so many talents and good ideas. So they, they basically provide feedback and direction for me. And then I try to execute 
what they think should be done. And so I serve, kind of serve as president, executive director, I'm the webmaster, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I'm the one who can work on this full time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just in a good position to do that now that I'm retired. But other people on, the, in, on, the commit, on this advisory group uh, chip in in different ways. And then we have um, a whole sky quality monitoring team that's comprised of some people in that group, but also other volunteers from the community. Before we get into um, the bylaw that you just mentioned, um, do you have any data on how Nantucket compares with other areas that we're familiar with? In other words, not in the middle of Wyoming, which we all know is going to be very dark, but compared to other places in New England, say, is the problem worse here? So that's a hard question to answer. We are better than some places, but not as good as other places. Like there's some places in Maine that are quite dark. There's a International Dark Sky uh, Park that's been certified up there. So their skies are probably darker than ours because they they don't have a lot of people living in the park. Yeah. Um, but for um, compared to Boston, of course, we yeah. are much better off. And compared to a lot of places, we're much better off. Um, but there is a, a sky quality monitoring uh, scale. Um, and we've been taking these measurements uh, for the last year in eight locations. And the island average on this scale comes uh, to 20.65. And to put that in context, uh, 20.2 is when uh, it's virtually impossible to see the, micro, uh, the Milky Way with your naked eye. The lower the number, the means more light pollution. The higher the number means the darker the sky is. So we're, as an island, at, at about 20.65. We really want to be over 21. We want to be, I don't know, 21.5 would be good. And we have some areas on the island that actually are that dark, um, but there are other areas, mid-island mainly, yeah. and town, that are bringing that number down. And the, the, the challenge is to control the light pollution in mid-island so that um, even in the conservation areas, you still will be able to see, see the Milky Way. And if, if the light in the, the worst polluted areas keeps going up, we, we won't be able to see the Milky Way from other places on the island. And, and we don't want to fall into that category, which is what has happened to most of the world. Well, if you go to Great Point, obviously that's a dark place, except there's a lighthouse. How much does a lighthouse affect? I, I know there's gonna be a different answer for every area we're talking about, but how disruptive is the lighthouse to the dark sky? Yeah, so we're not too worried about the lighthouse beacon because it's so um, infrequent and it's not pointing directly up into the night sky. Um, we, we don't take a measurement at a great point. That would be quite a trek out there every month, but we yeah. do go to Wall Winnet and Wall Winnet, mm -hmm. I think is, is comparable to Great Point. They're, they have excellent dark skies out there. Um, so that's the way we want to keep it. And Mat Mattacat's very dark, Alta Rock's very dark, Sconset's dark. The areas that are, are putting us, bringing the average down are town, the airport area, near the Nantucket Public Schools, and actually Surfside Beach, which I find a little surprising. I feel, I feel like mm. Surfside Beach has, definitely has the uh, potential to be darker, more like uh, Sconset and Madiket. Well, that surprises me too. And Why is that? I, I I don't live out in Surfside and I don't go out there at night. I, <laughs> I need to find time to do that. But um, since I don't have commercial development out there, it must be from housing, the lights on housing. There are enough houses that are occupied enough of the time. Well, so here's the thing about the dark sky movement. You can have occupied houses, you can have lots of development, you can still have dark skies. It's all in mm -hmm. the type of lighting that you put outdoors. And so I suspect what's happening maybe out there is there's maybe a lot of up lighting. Uh, it's popular to light trees and shrubs, and sometimes people like to light their houses. Um, sometimes around pools you'll see a lot, a lot of up lighting. That is not dark sky friendly, but you, you can have lighting and you can have actually a lot of houses and you can still be dark sky friendly if you just use the right type of outdoor lighting. That brings us to the bylaw that I just mentioned. Uh, it's the 2023 annual town meeting on Nantucket, a bylaw that you put together, a very lengthy, detailed bylaw. 
Uh, that was passed at town meeting by almost a two to one margin. So it wasn't even close. Tell us what was in that bylaw or what is in that bylaw. Well, so this bylaw um, basically reflects what's considered current best practices for regulating outdoor lighting. And I want to give credit where credit's due. I didn't come up with it by myself, uh, not by a long shot. I uh, relied on um, outdoor lighting experts, um, both in the um, International Dark Sky Association, as well as a lighting designer in um, Cambridge, as well as the Massachusetts chapter of the National Dark Sky Association. So I, and I also spent years studying what other towns had done, what worked and what didn't work. And anyway, yeah, I, I put together this bylaw and what it does is try to regulate the four aspects that of lighting that are problematic. One is how much lighting goes up and out instead of down to where it's actually needed. The other is the color temperature of light, which refers to how much blue light is being emitted. And it's the blue light that has been found to be so harmful to humans and wildlife and um, affecting our ability to see the stars. How, how uh, is it detrimental to humans and wildlife? Um, Bad in what way? So color temperature, so the blue light, well, um, trying to think, think how to describe it uh, simply. It's, it's basically for wildlife and humans affecting circadian rhythms and just natural, oh, okay. yeah. natural behavior of mm -hmm. animals and people. Um, so the, the, the blue light has become, sort of became a problem with the uh, introduction of LED street lights. Mm -hmm. or, I'm sorry, LED lights, which are energy efficient and we want to encourage people to use. But because of the technology, there's a greater range of, of blue light in it. And what they have found that when it goes beyond the sort of um, natural light, which is closer to um, incandescent light, mm -hmm. it just is harmful to basically every, every living thing that they've studied from uh, you know, mammals to insects, birds, it's even affecting plants. Um, because all living things kind of just need the natural day and night. So all this artificial light at night with all the blue light is making the night into day and it's just affecting mm -hmm. everybody, every, all the rhythms. But I had mentioned there were four aspects. Color yes. temperature was one. The amount of, uh, of up lighting and side lighting is the other. Uh, third would be the, um, the brightness of light and that's the, mm -hmm. that's the lumen output. Um, <clears throat> so that's um, different from color temperature. You can have um, a lot of blue light, but maybe you don't have it as bright. But we want to have both low color temperature and l low lumen output. And then the fourth thing is how long the light is left on. And that's where you see so much waste, where lights are left on all night, not serving any purpose, really. No. So <clears throat> the, the bylaw that passed and that I drafted... Um, addresses all those things. Um, there are exceptions throughout, which makes what makes the regulation complicated, but you want exceptions to, um, well, for things like safety and security lighting. People want to have, want to feel safe in their home, so sure. you make exceptions for that. Um, the onion light that's so common to Nantucket, if you know and what I mean. Us, tell us what an well, onion light Well, it's like the, it's that is. nautical looking light where you, the bulb is exposed. It's like you might see on a ship and it has little uh, um, pieces around it. I, I can't explain it, but it's like a, well, the, the a nautical bulb, light. The bulb is shaped like a giant onion is how I'm thinking of it. Is well, that, that's the, I, the fixture that is right? faced like a, the fixture is kind of shaped like an onion. Yeah. Uh, it depends, there's so many shapes now, but the, okay. it's shaped like an onion and it has a little top. But the bulb itself inside, it would be a regular bulb. But the bulb, just the way it's designed, the bulb is visible. So that light mm -hmm. is going up and out. But those are so popular here, I wouldn't dare try to ban them. I mean, they, they, that is the Nantucket look, right? And I love them too. So in that case, there's an exception for that kind of light, and you just um, have a, 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 a bulb that's 600 lumens or less. And for those who are still thinking in terms of um, wattage and of brightness, that would be roughly equivalent to a 40-watt incandescent bulb. But that is... Um, sufficient, according to the experts, for lighting like on your porch or, you know, your back door. So, 
so what we're trying to do is just uh, have people think more carefully about what they put in their outdoor light, taking into for their outdoor light and taking into account the harm that has been discovered. Well, since I heard about your group, um, I've been thinking, well, how does this apply to our house? And I'm sure the same things that I've come across, most other people could too. We have a front porch light, but I turn it off when I go to bed Great. because there's a street light that's right there. Um, but our back door also has a light, and I leave that on because there's kind of a black hole behind our house. Mm -hmm. And for security reasons, I like to keep it on all night. Mm -hmm. But in some of your literature, you talk about a security myth. In other words, the lights aren't doing as much as you think they might be doing in terms of security. Can you talk about that a bit? Okay, so the myth is that um, more light is better for terms of, for, for safety and security. And there's actually no um, conclusive evidence that that's true. And on the contrary, there's, there's studies done, and you can illustrate this with um, different uh, pictures, but if your light is too bright, it actually creates dark shadows um, where people with bad intentions could hide. Mm -hmm. um, if it's um, creating a lot of glare, um, it could be it could be blinding you or drivers who are driving by. So that's also a safety issue. Um, so, like I said in the bylaw, we make exceptions. For, an exception was made for safety and security lighting. So you can have that light on in your your back. You just mm -hmm. should have it uh, low uh, low lumens, which will be sufficient and won't create those back dark shadows. Which I'm happy other, to say we do. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing you could do is if you have it on a motion sensor so that it goes mm. off when motion isn't detected, that's actually exempt from the regulations. Um, that's huh. that would be temporary lighting, you know, um, and you wouldn't even have to meet these other requirements. But if you don't, a lot of people don't like motion sensors. You just have, you know, just lower the lower the brightness and and lower the color temperature, and you'll be able to have those. That's interesting because there, we have a, a house in our neighborhood that is a motion sensor. Every time a deer walks by or whatever, but it is brighter. Um, so now that's, I know. Mm -hmm. That's what the they're doing is okay. I mean, it's 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 legal, but um, that's the trade-off, and that's not the preferred. The brighter, like no. if you have it on motion sensor, you would like it also to have the right color temperature and lower lumens. But you know, you had to make compromises yeah. and to get it passed. And so, you know, I, I kind of wanted to meet people where they were in terms of how they how much lighting they felt they needed for safety and security, but. I'm actually hoping through education, you know, to convince people you don't, you know, even though that's allowed under the bylaw, really what I'd, you know, would even be even better for your neighbors and wildlife and for yeah. yourself would be to, to, to make it, you know, dimmer. Now, businesses are subject to one thing and residences may be subject to something else in certain cases. Um, that's, that's not exactly the way I would put it. So. Businesses and uh, residential properties are subject to the, th these, these general requirements that I mentioned, mm -hmm. but they, businesses are allowed a little more latitude. For example, the timing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, homeowners would have to have it off by 11, but if a business stayed open beyond 11, they could have it on, you know, for up to an hour after closing a business. So that's like an exception okay. made for businesses. Um, the other thing is on, on safety and security. So, on safety and security lighting, they are allowed uh, brighter lighter. So when I talked about limitations on brightness, there's a certain cap for residences, but businesses get to have more lighting. So mm -hmm. maybe they need more lighting for, you know, a parking lot or whatever. Um, so it's not that there are different regulations. It's just there are exceptions made for businesses. They mm -hmm. get a little more lighting. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, there are different situations, different yep. needs, and so on. Right. Um, street lights, hmm. they're not residential, they're not business, uh, they're sort of their own category. Um, how are those treated and uh, where do you see room for improvement? We could do a whole show just on street <laughs> lights. LED street lights are a complicated uh, subject. Um, so on Nantucket, the, the street lights that you see that are on utility poles, they sort of look yes. like a cobra, they're called cobra head. Yeah. Those are actually owned by a national grid. Yes. And um, unless the town were to buy those, um, National Grid puts in what they 
they want to put in. Um, and we can what get they, into that. Uh, well, let's get into that. Uh, but, but I want to say the other streetlights, the, the decorative streetlights, are owned by the town. Yes. And so they are, those are definitely uh, regulated by the bylaw. But there's a special section in there because then you get into something called bug ratings, which is um, a rating for how much backlighting there is, uplighting, and glare. And so there's a special requirement for streetlights because if they're right outside your bedroom window, you don't want it, <laughs> you don't, and they have to be brighter than a normal porch light. So um, anyway, there's a whole separate category for streetlights, but you want to talk about the national grid lights. Yeah, why are they not subject to the same set of rules and regs as the well, town is? So national grid, the way it works now, national grid's not, First of all, I want to say, with as long as we have the HPS, high-pressure sodium streetlights, um, that's not contributing a huge amount to uh, light pollution at the moment. It's the and LED. that's what we usually see? That's what we have now for the most part. There's some LED streetlights that have been installed on Nantucket. Okay. But I think only about 10 so far of the national grid-owned lights. And national grid will convert those to LEDs at the request of the town. But when they, if the town requests National Grid to put in, as it stands now, National Grid puts what they want in. And right now it's a 3,000 Kelvin, and it's not a great fixture in terms of this bug rating. And some of them don't have shields. So under the bylaw, I tried to write it so that those are captured too, that you know, if the town has any control over what is put in, then they have to meet this bug rating even for those lights. Um, and I'm, I'm just hoping... <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping the town will follow its own bylaw, and, and given the, the big support for it, I hope they will. But it's a little more, even more complicated than that, because if, na if the town were to buy the fixtures from National Grid, they could put in, they could purchase and put in even better uh, streetlights than National Grid is choosing to put in. Um, and this is what I'm encouraging the town to do. This is what the towns on Martha's Vineyard did when they switched to LED. They bought the fixtures from National Grid, decided what to put in themselves, and then hired, um, you know, uh, retained somebody on the, the mainland to put them in and to maintain them. Um, so that's what I'm encouraging the town to do. But so far there's been reluctance to do that because they don't, they feel like that's more complicated. But it would be the best for us in terms of our dark skies. And it would cost the town some money, obviously, to buy what National Grid now owns. Well, that's not the big expense. That, that's, that's not much at all. It's, really? it's purchasing the LED fixtures themselves mm -hmm. because LED streetlights are, are fairly expensive, but they last a long time. And then over time, you're actually saving money on through the tariff system, everything in, in terms of uh, energy costs. Um, I, ha I asked uh, a group specializing in this to do an analysis, cost-benefit analysis, and I think, if I remember correctly, they said that the t these would pay itself off and save the money over time just within a matter of a few years, like maybe oh. five or ten years or something like that. And this is why other towns are going that route. Um, I think the town is reluctant so far to do that just because of the kind of headache of, of having to deal with it yet another contract or managing another yeah. contract. But this is what the towns in Martha's Vineyard did, and I think, I think that's really the right thing to do in terms of what's best for Nantucket. I do understand it's sort of an administrative hassle, but I'm hoping in the end that's what they'll agree to do. Um, they have um, asked National Grid recently to put some LEDs on Bathing Beach Road. Um, I just found out about that. And that's out by the jetties for out, those who That's that road know. going to the jetties. Yep. And I just went out to check them out. And like, they're too white, um, they're too bright, and they're too glary. If you go out mm -hmm. there, you're going, oh, you would not want that beside your bedroom window, I'm pretty sure. So, um, you know, I've let the town know my reaction to that. Um, and I'm hoping um, they won't. This is not the one that they will put in on the rest of the island. And I should mention, the bylaw doesn't go into effect until January 1st. So right now... Yeah, we're in the, July of 2023, and I guess it has to go to the Attorney General's office. Yeah, so when a, when a general like, bylaw, like bylaw pass, passes, it goes to the uh, Attorney General for the state of Massachusetts to review it and make sure it doesn't conflict with any state 
law. Yeah. But I know that there's no risk that that will happen because the state of Massachusetts doesn't regulate light pollution on the on the on the state level. Um, they're the only state in New England that that hasn't adopted. Yeah, you told uh, me that before pollution. the show, and I was yeah. astounded to hear that because yeah. uh, you would think if everybody else did it in this region, that we'd be doing it too. So there's a there's a state bill pending, uh, a dark sky bill pending. Uh, hopefully, it'll get through. But even if that were passed, it doesn't regulate lighting on the lo on the local level like the mm -hmm. bylaw uh, that we're talking about does. It would regulate what um, uh, state funded and municipal funded lighting would be, um, and also, it, it, it has to do with like um, requiring a tariff that would uh, reward towns for using lower lumens in their streetlights, if that makes sense. Right now, you're paying for, we are paying, the town is paying for um, lighting that they may not even be using. And when you switch to LEDs mm. and you want to dim it down, you want the price that you're charged for it to reflect that dimming, and you want to pay for only the the power you're using. And so that's all part of this state bill that's pending. Well, like any other bylaw, it can be amended in the future. So it's it's possible bylaw, that, yes. that um, National Grid might be, through an amended bylaw, um, they might in the future have to do what the town is already doing now. Do I have, am I understanding this correctly? So the way the it, bylaw is written, uh, as after January 1st, if the town asks National Grid to replace a COBRA head and it's at their direction, they would have to comply with the bylaw. And my understanding is what their National Grid is putting in now would not comply with the bylaw. So the way I see it, the town can't ask National Grid to replace any more of these COBRA head lights um, and comply with the bylaw until National Grid agrees to stock different kinds of street lights. And there are better ones out there that National Grid has chosen to purchase. Well, it makes it sound as if they could consciously be in violation of the bylaw. Am I understanding well, you no. correctly? So the town or National Grid? National Grid. Or, so, or anybody. I, I mean to pick on them. but Well, so National Grid was not going to replace anything unless the town asks it to. If the town, after January 1st, when the bylaws in effect, asks National Grid to put in lights that are in violation, yeah, they, I, you know, the town would be violating its own bylaw. But I'm really hoping it doesn't come to that. I hope the town will respect the wishes of the community. But the problem with National Grid is they have a stock of streetlights. Like they don't service just Nantucket. Like oh. they're, so they bought this this particular streetlight, I don't know, how many years ago? And they have a lot of them left, I they guess. They probably have a lot of them <laughs> left. Um, and perhaps they would like to use them on Nantucket. But uh, yeah, because other the other towns, like I said, a lot of other towns in Massachusetts and, and the area that National Grid services have actually purchased their lights and are controlled, you know, and they're putting in their own LEDs. Nantucket lights, uh, sorry, Nantucket is one of the the remaining communities who National Grid still, where National Grid still owns these Cobra headlights. Um, and so if they haven't used up their stock, of course, they want to use the stock use up their stock. But the other problem is the tariff. Like, I, I tried to work with National Grid to get a tariff uh, approved for something under 3,000 Kelvin. It used to be they would only install streetlights with 4,000 Kelvin. And at my urging and the urging of many, they finally, um, there's a whole process for getting a tariff approved. And they got a tariff approved, I think it was 2021, uh, for um, 3,000 Kelvin. Well, now tech, street lights have improved since then. What they really need to do is go back and ask for a tariff for a 2400 Kelvin, a 2200 Kelvin, because those kind of lights are, those kind of fixtures are available now. But it's a whole process, and National Grid so far has declined to do that. Well, but it's a moving target. It's a so. little bit of a moving target, but, um, you know, other, let me just say their competitors have kept up with it. So it sounds, I'm, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but it sounds as if eventually this will be worked out, but it's not going to happen right away. I think that's fair to say. And okay. my yep. urging to the town is wait. <laughs> yeah. Wait until National Grid catches up with technology and mm -hmm. is willing to do the right thing. Or purchase the streetlights. It won't cost that much to purchase them. 
if you need, you know, I've told them if, they, if you need help, if financial help, I'm willing to, to, you know, try to raise money to to pay for the right lights. And there are contractors on the mainland who can provide the, uh, you know, the installation services and the maintenance services, just like they do in Martha's Vineyard. So, I'm really hoping over time this will work itself out. But it's something I'm definitely keeping an eye on. Anytime you talk about a bylaw on Nantucket of any kind. The question of enforcement comes along. Yes. Um, who has the power, or what organiz or what entity has the power to enforce this bylaw? Well, unknown, unbeknownst to many people, Nantucket has something, somebody called a lighting enforcement officer, and this was a position that was created in 2005 when the um, the first outdoor lighting bylaw was adopted. The the bylaw that's being replaced by the one that was just passed. So there is a there is somebody in town government. He um, uh, sits in the uh, plus offices, the yeah. planning and land use services offices. Um, but unfortunately, what's happened is the duties have been assigned to somebody who has many other duties, and to date hasn't been able to devote a lot of attention to lighting enforcement. So that's one thing in his defense. The other is. That 2005 bylaw had some metrics and some language that were very um, difficult to um, apply. So when it comes to enforcement, I always try to say that there's two different aspects of it. One is having the personnel to enforce it. The other is having the right terminology, the right metrics, having a provision that's actually enforceable. So when drafting the bylaw, I tried to correct all the ambiguities and um, there were some metrics in there that um, required a special light meter that's very difficult to use. Um, and this lighting enforcement officer all these years didn't even have it. So I okay. encouraged them to buy it, and but he found it difficult to use. I find it difficult to use. So I took those kind of measurements out and we um, changed to um, metrics. Uh, most of them are based on lumens and this Kelvin temperature, which are, are things that are part of a product specification. So you don't need a light meter to, to, to figure out if they're in compliance or not. Um, but I knew going into this that the town probably wouldn't have a lot of resources to throw at enforcement. So my main objective this time around was to get the right standards on the books so that I would have um, uh, a better chance of being able to convince people to uh, comply voluntarily. Before, it was very awkward to say, you know, at a minimum, comply with what's in the uh, outdoor lighting bylaw, but actually those are so out of date, what you really need to do is this. And that got very confusing. So now the right standards are on the book. We will be producing a lot of um, practical guidance for how to comply with it. And I really think most people want to do the right thing and um, voluntarily comply. If we're not getting a lot of voluntary compliance down the line, um, I do have some other ideas about maybe ways to amend the bylaw to um, improve on the enforcement side. But um, Hopefully that won't be necessary. Well, you're trying to get people to do what most people do with stop signs. There's not a policeman on every corner, but most people, not all people, especially in July and August, but most people do stop yes. at a stop sign because they think it's the right thing to do and the safe thing to do. Right. And I think the more we educate people on the harm from artificial light at night mm -hmm. and why it's important to comply with it, and how easy it is to comply with it, yeah. and that it's not expensive. I just think most people uh, will will do the right thing. I guess I'm an optimist, but uh, you know. So my goal at this point is to provide the information, um, you know, the guidance, uh, you know, very practical guidance about okay, these are the products we recommend, and here's how you get them. I want to work with um, the local retail shops to make sure they stock the right products to make it easy to comply. And I'm trying to raise money to um, help those who need financial assistance in complying. For most people, it's just a matter of changing a light bulb mm -hmm. and, you know, a couple dollars, you know, depending on how many lights you have on it. Um, but some small businesses, maybe some nonprofits might have lighting fixtures themselves that need to be upgraded. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I'd like to be able to provide financial assistance. But I'm telling you, so one nonprofit who's um, been very supportive is Remain Nantucket, and they have seven properties, and they are uh, working with me right now to upgrade their lighting to be compliant with the new regulations without waiting for the five years that mm -hmm. they're allowed under the bylaw for existing lighting. And we've assessed all their properties, seven of them, and for the most part, it really is just changing up the light bulb. It's so simple. Mm -hmm. But you need to know, you know, you want to know that not all light bulbs are created equal, right? So um, I'm working with this expert, and we're coming up with some very good products that we will be promoting to people. And we're going to be putting them at the Remain Nantucket properties, and we'll We'll promote that and show before and after pictures and how easy it was. And I think in only one, let's see, they have just a couple instances where they had um, things that might need a new fixture, but um, the replacement fixture is not going to be very expensive at all. Before we go further, tell us a bit about yourself personally. What's okay. your professional background? How did you first come to Nantucket? Okay, well, um, my career was made at the uh, Department of Justice. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. and uh, served as a trial attorney um, in an office that uh, basically represented the federal government from the president on down when it got sued for violating either a constitution, a statute, or a regulation. So it was really interesting work. Um, I started coming to Nantucket when I met my uh, husband. Uh, I think the first time I came was in 1985, soon after meeting him, and have been coming every year since. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, for a long time, I could only come for a week or two, um, but I retired in 2015, and we've been coming. Now I spend almost five months here. It keeps getting longer each year. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing about my background that uh, sort of... Uh, maybe worth noting is my husband was um, a foreign correspondent for part of his time at the Washington Post, and we spent uh, time abroad. We were four years in Egypt and then four years in India. And so each time I left the, <laughs> the Department of Justice and had to come back. But um, in the summers during those years, I always brought the kids back to Nantucket. That was where we came to sort of ground ourselves again and uh, get ready for the, you know, nine more months in the developing world. Um, so we never missed a summer all those years. And my kids have been coming every summer since they were born. My husband has been coming, of course, even longer than I am. He started coming when he was five. Uh, so um, we've had long connections to, to Nantucket. I'm glad I asked that question. I didn't know about your professional background and your husband's professional <laughs> background. So uh, that's fascinating. What you're do you mentioned some of the things you're doing now with Nantucket Lights, but let's go a little further. You have a, I've got a note to myself, you have a printed guide, is that correct? So we had, a, yes, we had a brochure called A Guide <clears throat> uh, to Responsible Outdoor Lighting for Residences. Um, and we, to date, have given out about 4,000 copies of that. Um, but it's now out of date because it refers to the old bylaw. So I now have to come up with a new brochure. Um, but we're going to be coming up with also um, just some really detailed practical guidance on how to comply with the bylaws to make it easy for everybody. I think you touched on this a few minutes ago, but I think it was in your newsletter you referred to the July 17 and July 19 hearings. Is that what you were talking about where you now have to go to two hearings instead of just one? Because, so, of the, because of the vagaries of the Massachusetts State House? Yes, that refers to these uh, dark sky bills that are pending before the Massachusetts legislature. And there was, supposed to, there was a hearing on Monday, July 17th. There was supposed to have been one yesterday, the 19th, but it actually got rescheduled because it was a fire at the— uh, That's right. There was the, a fire in the State House. In the State Everything's House. Everything's fine now, yeah. but there was a fire. Right. So suddenly now this hearing has been rescheduled for November. I think uh, oh the proponents are going to try to move that up a bit. Um, that was at the Senate hearing or the House hearing? With the legislature here. Well, I honestly don't remember which is which. I think the Senate was going first for the on Monday, and then the House was scheduled to go on Wednesday, and I think it's going to be the House that has to reschedule. Okay. And it's, it's worth pointing out that our state rep, Dylan Fernandez, is very much behind 
what you're trying to do. Yes, he is a co-sponsor of the House version of the bill, so we really appreciate that. Okay. Um, do you have data? I know Nantucket Lights has only been around for two years, but I'm wondering how far back you have located data that shows how much deterioration there's been over the decades. So before I got involved, nobody was tracking this. At all, really. Right. Um, so there is satellite data that we can refer to, but nobody on the island was trying to take measurements like we're doing now. That started uh, mm -hmm. last summer in partnership with the Mariah Mitchell Association. So what I can say about data before that is um, satellite data um, shows there's it picks up on, on light all over the world, and you can you can generate these light pollution maps. And what the satellite data shows is that on Nantucket for the uh, last ten years, it's been increasing at a rate of two point four percent a year. So that's about twenty five percent. That means our skies are twenty five percent brighter now than they were just ten years ago. I don't think the satellite data goes back beyond that, so we don't really mm -hmm. know. But that's pretty alarming increase just these last 10 years, that especially is. when you consider satellite data they discover doesn't pick up the blue light emitted by LEDs. Mm -hmm. And LEDs started becoming popular, what, you know, in the last five or six years. So the increase that I'm talking about, 25%, it's actually probably a lot worse than that. So we're not quite sure. But we started taking these sky quality meter readings last year. We have a whole year of data. Um, so that's going to serve as a baseline going forward to show us objectively, is it getting brighter? Is it getting darker? We're hoping it's going to get darker instead of continuing to get brighter. But even um, we were into our second year, and I, I crunched the numbers, and I think I mentioned before the island average was 20 point, um, six five on yes. that SQM scale. Well, the first month in July into our second year of data, just taking that one month, the island average is now 20.56. So it's so dropped it's gotten, even a yes, little bit in the summer. So it's getting a little worse. So this is why, you know, we want to really urge people to c comply with the bylaw and do it sooner than later. <laughs> um, under the bylaw, existing lighting has a grace period of five years to come into compliance. Um, that's to give people time to budget for it, especially the town and the schools and businesses. But we're really hoping uh, homeowners will will make the changes they need to make sooner than that. And you know, again, I'm going to try to raise money to help anybody who needs it. I'm hoping to raise enough money to um, give away bulbs. You know, these low lumen bulbs mm -hmm. for all those onion lights on the island, <laughs> so that you know, it's like I would love to be able to just deliver to every door. You have two onion lights here. Have two bulbs, um, and to show them how easy it is to make the change. I mentioned earlier in the show that there have been more houses built in about the last forty or fifty years than in the preceding three hundred and fifty years. But the statistic I like to to mention to people, and it shocked me when I realized it was true. What the summer population was when I moved here in 1971, which was about 25,000, year-round was three. The old summer population is now what the year-round population is. It's gone up about eight times in the 50 years I've lived here. And obviously what goes with, one of the many things that goes with that is bright skies. Well. I don't agree with that. I think really? you can have more buildings, but if everybody used the well, right you, you kind can, of fixture. But, but do you right now? No. Yes. <laughs> no, that's yeah, the that problem. Was, yeah, that, that, was, that was my point. Yeah. That's the problem. Yes. So, the yes, I see what you're saying now. So, yes, this 25% increase is, is probably due to a lot of the new buildings coming along and using a lot of uplighting because um, it's not really. It's not really the uh, street lights, so it hasn't changed over the last 10 years. Yeah. If anything, some of those have burnt out, so that can't be the one contributing it. There, there, are, some <laughs> there are some more businesses, there are some more neighbor, there are some more um, uh, homeowner uh, uh, developments with HOAs that their street lights are, are too bright. Uh, the town has installed some that are too, too bright and too white. Um, so that's contributing it to it. But I would suspect a lot of that is coming from the new houses and this fad of having up lighting and too much lighting. And what I'm noticing and people are complaining is even some of the seasonal people, when they go off, they just leave their lights on. Yep. And I, I think there's a sense maybe from where they are that you have to have this 
uh, security lighting on for property security, and they just mm -hmm. leave them on all the time. And you know, it's just not needed here. And so I've got to convince people of that. I, I really need to bring a culture change and reaching the seasonal people to get them to tone it down as part of that. Before we go, tell us how people can get in touch with Nantucket Lights. Well, we have a website. Um, I encourage everybody to go to that. It's nantucketlights.org. And um, uh, you can contact us through the website, but our email address is also uh, a way to contact us, and that's nantucketlights at gmail.com. And you have merchandise available there. We do have some merchandise. Uh, well, we have, um, well, if you call merchandise, we have a bumper sticker that we actually give mm -hmm. out for free and mm -hmm. encourage anybody to put our bumper sticker on their car to help spread the word. There's a, we have a, there's a t-shirt that this um, Discover the Night on Nantucket that can be mm -hmm. ordered. Um, that's actually from the International Dark Sky Association's um, uh, bonfire website, but uh, the money doesn't go to us. It goes to help advocates around the world uh, as well as us. Um, and, well, you might be thinking of the, Nantucket, the dark sky candle, too. We don't sell that directly, but there's a dark sky Nantucket candle that a, a supporting business um, it launched uh, earlier this year. I guess it was in April, and that's available online through their shop. It's the Abigail Fox Design Shop that's doing that, and that's kind of cool. And if somebody wants to volunteer, I'm sure you're not going to say no, but... <laughs> They can find out how to do that through your website, I assume. Yeah, you would you would contact us. Um, um, we we do have some things that volunteers can help with, but what uh, the the best way people can support us is joining our mailing list and getting our newsletters and updates and calls to action. Mm -hmm. So that's what helped me get the bylaw through is having a, a long uh, email distribution list, so I could mm -hmm. keep them up to date and say this is what you need to do. You know, the the um, this is who you need to write to. So when it comes to LED streetlights, for example, if that becomes something I need to um, uh, do more, get more support for, there'll be a call to action. And so if you're on our mailing list, you can help out that way. And of course, uh, donating is, uh, is, would be a great help. Um, and on that front, we, so we have a GoFundMe campaign that you can find the link to on our website. But I've also I've been in talks with the Community Foundation for Nantucket about trying to set up a fund with them uh, for more substantial donations uh, where you would get a 501c3 tax deduction. Mm -hmm. And um, they provide the mechanism to do that. But what I have found is um, to set up a fund, you have to have $10,000 in the first place to set mm -hmm. it up, and you have to keep that in the balance all the time. If I had ten thousand dollars, I wouldn't necessarily need as much money. But um, so, any, anybody out there, if you want to contribute ten thousand dollars to get us started, that'd be great. But anyway, I'm in the process of trying to raise money for that, and then hope to use that to raise money for this financial assistance that I'm hoping to give out. Gail Walker, thank <laughs> you for joining me. I think this is a wonderful thing you're doing, and uh, it seems to me you've accomplished a huge amount in a very short space of time. So I wish you luck going forward. Well, thank you, Charlie, and thank you for the support. It was, My pleasure. It was a real honor to be here. Thank you. For Profiles on Nantucket Community Television, Channel 18, I'm Charlie Walters. Thanks for tuning in. Please join me again. <laughs>